Old bloke goes to Las Vegas. Las Vegas to me means Sinatra at the Sands, which no longer exists, and the Strip, lined with casino hotels, and the desert. It brings to mind the film Casino with Joe Pesky, and the horrible bit where the mob club him and his brother to death. So I better be careful what I say. First inhabited at least 10,000 years ago, the first non Native American only stumbled into the valley in 1829. Spanish for the meadows, Las Vegas was founded in 1910, but only stepped up a gear in 1931 when casino gambling became legal in Nevada. And divorce was cut down to six weeks. Though why a quickie divorce lured people in their thousands, I'm not sure. The construction of the Hoover Dam also boosted the population a good bit here. I literally had a couple of days in Vegas, that was it, with an old pal of mine called Gripper. I think I once asked him why I was called that, and I'm sure he said it was something to do with the size of his hands, or something. Anyway, there we were, in this big old hotel, that looked like something straight out of the 70s. The decor was certainly authentic, I'll give them that, and the place was jam-packed with slot machines that pinged and whirred 24-7. Not really my thing. I mean, the odds have got to be against you, big time. Then I found the roulette and blackjack tables, the croupiers shuffling and dealing while the slightly seedy-looking waitresses were scouting and touting for tips. I mean, how backward is America? You're still allowed to smoke in these places. Apparently, they're just too worried about putting the real gamblers off if they ban it. Minging, smelly and minging, just my opinion, of course. So there's this odour of sweat, fags and bleach that permeates the walls. Our room is at the end of a long, long corridor. Like the ones in the film The Shining. Rows and rows of doors disappearing off into the distance. And the food? Well, the first night's wasn't so good. Not Gripper's fault that I'm a fussy bar steward. But I hate buffets. Reheated Ming and rehashed hash. A big sign says, Dishes from all over the world. I may have been better if it was just a collection of really interesting pottery. They kind of spoiled it when they tried to put food on there. I did get a piece of rare beef, which is actually okay, and still in the jet lag zone. I probably wouldn't have appreciated anything else anyway. You see, we were trying to do that thing where you beat time. I know it's really three in the morning back home, says Gripper, but let's get a beer and pretend it's only 7pm. My eyes are almost dropping out my face onto the ashtrays that line the bar. What? I murmur. Here, he says, slide me another bottle of beer. I got the eight for the price of four deal. Jeez, I murmur. It must be jammy time, surely. Don't call me Shirley, says Gripper. Casting up that old airplane joke. He doesn't actually look like Shirley, got to admit. He's six foot tall, bearded. He's more like a shugger, maybe a mountain man. A few more of these, then we'll hit the buffy again, he says. Oh no. I look up, and there's a basketball game on the telly. And the guy next to me pipes up, Hey man, who do you support? I look suitably bewildered and try to read the screen for some clue. Eh, the ones in the blue? I friggin' hate the warriors, man, he drawls. Tapping away at some betting computer thing built into the bar while constantly feeding it dollar bills. Yeah, I answer. They're shit. You said you support the guys in the blue, right? Aye, suppose I did say that, aye. Well, the guys in the blue are the warriors, man. Ah, yeah. I think as quickly as I can. But they're shit tonight, right? They're the winning team, man, he whines. Yeah, but they're not winning by enough, I say. Try to avoid eye contact. You're a full of shit, man. He says before spinning round in his spinny seat to annoy some other poor get. I get the feeling that I've narrowly missed being challenged a gunfight out in the street. Ah well, we force down a few more chips and beers and then stagger up to our double beds. I toss and turn until I see a wee chink of sunlight between the old green curtains. That's it, I decide. I'm going for a run. So, I pull on my togs and step out into the early morning air which is currently sitting at 92 degrees. Jeez, it's hard to breathe, never mind run. But I find enough pavement to get myself around the perimeter of the hotel twice and chalk up 3k. You see, you have to be careful about road running in America. I think you can basically be shot if you're caught off the sidewalk. 
Then it was down to the queue for breakfast. And they are still there. People dotted over the floor area, still pulling on levers and staring in never-ending hope at the spinning lights. I wandered out to find the pool, but by this time it's 103 degrees and the only sign of life is a few black mockingbirds fighting over some dropped food. We better get going, says Gripper. I can see the famous strip behind him, MGM, the pyramids and all sorts of other tat, fading off into the distance. Where are we going today then, Gripper? You see, Gripper has every moment planned, which is great, because I can't be bothered thinking. It's just too hot. The Nevada desert, he says. Oh, and off we go. To somewhere even hotter, in our big maroon car. Down one of those roads that stretches off into infinity. Like the one in Notorious, where Cary Grant is buzzed by a plane until he hits a deck. Eventually, we reach some hills that mark the beginning of an Indian reservation. Crazy red Martian-like rocks stick out from the brush and I'm suddenly standing amongst the scrub thinking, rattlesnakes? But even in the fear-laced heat, it's kind of beautiful. I think we pay a few dollars to the local Native Americans to be there, kind of thing, you know, and we drive through this particular landscape of rock, tumbleweed and petrified trees. It's then, however, that I get a wee call to get myself back home. Some things are more important than pretending to be a cowboy. So, I head back to Vegas for one more night while Pete disappears off into the distance. I try to swim in that pool I found earlier on, but it's far too hot to be anything apart from fully submerged. I do find, hidden behind a sea of slot machines, a very decent Chinese, which serves up some of the best dishes I've ever tasted. I guess you just have to be more picky, look harder, and you'll find some gems in Vegas. I never got to see a show or lose more than a few dollars, so I won't write it off totally, not yet. But it's still not really my favourite place to be. So it's off home, via Calgary and Halifax, where I meet a nice Irish guy, who's a few pints with me at the airport. We chat, and I munch on some very nice scallops, and we end up, fun enough, just a row apart on the plane. Now he's a wee bit louder than I am, chatting away merrily to his fellow passengers, when the aero hostess asks... Have you had a few drinks, sir? Now, that's got to be a trick question. But Paddy, and yes, that was his name, smiles and says, Oh, just a few. Two, three, four, presses air hostess. Oh, well, to be sure. I'm, I'm not sure, says Paddy. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave the plane, she says. At this point, known fine well, I've had a wine or two, too. I slouch down in my seat and pretend to be invisible. Poor Paddy, it's actually ejected. And I have to say, he's very understanding about it all. But it just goes to show you, keep shtum until you know the lie of the land. Maybe tone it down a bit, or lay off the booze before you cruise. It is kind of hypocritical though, eh? They fill airports with bars and stuff, encourage people to party, and then feed you gallons of booze in the plane. Think about it. What other time in your life do you think it's perfectly normal to have a pint at 7.30am? Only in an airport. There's nothing more I hate than loudmouthed louts on a plane. Especially if they're kids about. Drink up, but shut up, or don't drink at all. That'd be my t-shirt logo. Anyway, remember, if you want to start running, you can't buy a better book than Old Bloke Goes Running. Especially if you're in your 50s or 60s and you want to get into it. Tells you all the details, what to buy, the kit. All the things that trip you up, as it were. And all the wonderful feelings and amazing sights you see when you do go out on it. So, if anyone is listening, thank you very much. And until next time, ciao for now!